Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Two of the authors that Lev Shestov is going to bring up quite often, both on their own and in relation to each other in All Things Are Possible, are Friedrich Nietzsche and Fyodor Dostoevsky, the one of them a German-born and German-language philosopher, but somebody who also worked with literature, as we'll talk about soon, and the other a novelist and short story writer from Russia who has a lot of philosophical ideas in the mouths of his characters and in the discussions that they have with each other in the lives that they live. And as it turns out, uh, if you look through Shestov's corpus, you will actually find a book specifically on Fyodor Dostoevsky and Friedrich Nietzsche and he calls this the, the philosophy of tragedy, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, right? So this is quite important. Shestov is what we can call one of the very first of the second wave of existentialists, one of the people who realizes the continuity of ideas and approaches between the people who we identify as the first wave, in particular in his case, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, really early on. Uh, later on, he, he realizes that Kierkegaard is doing something similar, which brought to his attention in the late 20s. And you could say that Shestov is one of several people who is drawing these connections. Another who he mentions in the book a little bit later on is Georg Brandes, the Danish uh, writer who lectures on Nietzsche and he sort of criticizes Nietzsche for getting a little bit too much uh, enamored with fame late in his life because Brandes is now talking about him. So what we can do in thinking about the importance of Nietzsche and Dostoevsky is look at the passages where they're being brought up together and then look at the things that Shestov has to say about them individually. And as it turns out, there, there are quite a few places where they are being discussed together. So one of these is in chapter 50, where he calls them inverted simulators. He says, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky seem to be typical inverted simulators, if one may use the expression. Simulation is deceiving, is, is putting forth something. What did they do? They imitated spiritual sanity, although they were spiritually insane. They knew their morbidity well enough, but they exhibited their disease only to that extent where freakishness passes for originality. With the sensitiveness peculiar to all who are in constant danger, they never went beyond the limits. The acts of the guillotine of public opinion hung over them. One awkward move and the execution automatically takes place, but they knew how to avoid unwarrantable moves. So what he's saying there is that they weren't people who were particularly well or integrated, but they did have some very useful insights and they did it in such a way as to continually push and push and push, but not incur some sort of public opinion uh, wrath that would have, would have destroyed the efforts that they were putting forward. So that's kind of an interesting idea. Another, he talks about uh, how they viewed um, conscience. And he says here, um, here we go. While conscience stands between the educated and lower classes, the only possible mediator, there can be no hope for mutual understanding. 
Conscience demands sacrifices, nothing but sacrifices. It says to the educated man, you are happy, well-off, learned, the people are poor, unhappy, ignorant. Renounce your well-being or soothe your conscience with suave speeches. And this is, in fact, what Tolstoy himself will do later on, right? And here's where he, he says something really interesting about these two thinkers. This is why Dostoevsky and Nietzsche were not afraid to speak in their own name. Why? Because he says, only the person who has nothing to sacrifice, nothing to lose, having lost everything, can hope to approach the people as an equal. How did Dostoevsky lose everything? Well, I mean, he was lined up in a what he thought was an execution. And they then, after not executing him, shipped him off to prison in Siberia with all these other people who had been sent out there uh, in, in a very rough environment for, for years. He comes back and begins writing, and he's never until the end of his life in any sort of secure financial position, not least because he gambles away his earnings in many cases, right? He's frantically writing in order to pay off debts. He understands what it's like to not really have anything. You could say something similar about Nietzsche. Nietzsche, you know, he does attain a nice position as a professor, but then has to leave it due to illness. And he's continually struggling with the illnesses of his life and also trying to get across ideas that, for the most part, are not particularly welcome. As a matter of fact, Nietzsche enjoys a much greater reputation after he's committed to a sanatorium and not doing any, any work um, than he does during his lifetime of alternating bed rest and uh, frantic periods of writing and thinking. So this is why Dostoevsky and Nietzsche were not afraid to speak in their own name. And here's the interesting uh, addition to that. They did not feel compelled to stretch up or to stoop down in order to be on a level with other human beings. They could just be where they were and you know, speak to, to anybody at any level. So that's another interesting feature. Um, Shestoff also remarks that in some cases their works are you know, really great, and in other cases, um, like he says, sense and folly are not at all native qualities in a person. In a crisis, a stupid person becomes clever. And you know, he says, who do we look at for an example? What a gaping simpleton Dostoevsky looks in his injured and insulted, not to mention poor folk, these early works, right? But in Letters from the Underground and the rest of his books, he is the shrewdest and cleverest of writers. So something happens that transforms their perspective and they gain insights that they can communicate. He also says the same may be said of Nietzsche, Tolstoy, or Shakespeare. In his birth of tragedy, Nietzsche seems just like the ordinary, honest, rather simple, blue-eyed provincial German student. And in Zarathustra, he reminds one of Machiavelli. So, you know, Nietzsche actually criticizes the birth of tragedy himself later on. I think it's a great work, but Shestoff did not share that opinion, and he shared Nietzsche's own self-condemnation. But in the rest of his work, it's, it's quite brilliant, isn't it? The other thing that he, he suggests that's uh, similar about these two is that they both take to literature, and they take to literature for a particular reason. And you might say, well, wait a second. Dostoevsky wrote literature. Nietzsche, okay, he wrote Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and that's literature, I guess. He did write some poetry as well, um, and he wrote some music, which is not particularly good music. But most of his work is, is philosophy, isn't it? Or philology, at least, what we would now call linguistics and classics. And yes, that's kind of correct. But if you look at his style, is it really straight out philosophy? I mean, it's much more like Shestov and his form of writing. I mean, the most systematic work in, in, after Birth of Tragedy would be The Genealogy of Morals, which has three essays. But look at it. Read the book. It's actually ranging all over you know, different things, and it's organized into different paragraphs. They don't all map onto each other systematically. Then look at you know, uh, other works where it's aphorisms after aphorisms after aphorisms. So that is literature. And what's going on with that? Um, 
Well, here's the, the context. So Shestov says, um, in, the order of decor, in, in the interest of order and decorum, people will grant you a not too important place in their philosophy of life. For in a philosophy of life, as in a cemetery, a place is prepared for each and all, and everyone is welcome. There are also enclosures where rubbish is dumped to rot. But for those who have as yet no desire to be fit into a world philosophy, I would advise them to keep their tongue between their teeth or, like Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, take to literature. Take to literature. Why? Because in literature, you can do what you can't do in a philosophy of life. For example, you can have characters like, like Dostoevsky does who talk about philosophy and sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong, but are teaching us something in the process, making us think further. So, you know, Nietzsche is doing something similar in his reception of philosophy as well. Let's talk about Nietzsche then uh, on his own. So one of the things that uh, uh, Shestov picks up from Nietzsche that is really central to his work is that, um, you know, philosophy and other things like philosophy, like science, like um, other systematic approaches to things, these do not come out of some sort of absolute necessity that we manage to discover about the world, about life, about the human mind, these a prioris, as we can call them. Instead, like he says, the root of all of our philosophies lies not in our objective observations, but in the demands of our own heart, in the subjective moral will. So that, you know, the ways in which people do philosophy arise out of their, as Nietzsche says, biography. They arise out of the logic of their life and their desires and their experiences. So there's another realization here as well. He talks about um, Nietzsche's instinct not being at fault that science cannot be uprooted unless we first destroy morality. And again, if we think about the genealogy of morals, and in particular the third essay, you know, science did not simply replace religion and previous metaphysics with its own correct positivist point of view and sweep away all that detritus. It actually, science is a new form of theology. Science is a new form of metaphysics that thinks that it's advanced further, but is really driven by the same will of truth, the same asceticism as those others that were a little bit more disorganized and had, in some respects, you know, uh, blocked views, but also further views than, than the blinkered eye of the scientist. He also talks about, at one point, and I think this is quite uh, worth thinking about, something that could be the key to the philosophy of Nietzsche. Here's what he says. This comes up in a discussion about essentially skepticism. He says, we have sufficient grounds for taking life mistrustfully. It has defrauded us so often of our cherished expectations. So we could, you know, we can distrust life. But then he says, we have still stronger grounds for mistrusting reason. If, reason, if life deceived us, it was only because futile reason let herself be deceived. Maybe reason herself invented the deception and then to serve her own ambitious ends threw the blame on life so that life shall appear sick-headed. So the problem isn't really life, it's, it's actually rationality as applied to life. And he says, if we have to choose between life and reason, we choose life. Then we no longer need to try to foresee and explain. We can wait and accept all that is unalterable as part of the game. So this is an interesting idea. We are disappointed by life. We are disappointed by reason. Where should we lay the blame? What should we do in that case? Here's where he brings up Nietzsche. And he says, thus Nietzsche, having realized all his hopes had gradually crumbled, he could never get back to his former strength, but must grow worse every day, wrote in a private letter, um, I, and this is in, in German, uh, ich will es so schwer haben wie nur irgendein Mensch es hat. I, I have it you know, more difficult now than anybody else. Um, and he goes on and uh, says that, that he has um, the good conscience uh, to possess something that few 
people have and have had, right? Flugel um in Gleichnisse zu reden, right? Um, and he says, this is the key to the philosophy of, of Nietzsche. And so that's kind of an interesting idea that Nietzsche's own philosophy is developing under the impetus of realizing that even he has been screwed over by life and reason, and he's not going to get the time back. He's not going to get the days of health back. He has to figure out what to do and whether he's going to accept it. Let's talk about Dostoevsky. So here, <laughs> Shesta has a really uh, incisive uh, insight. This is in chapter 54. Uh, part one, it's better to be an unhappy man than a happy pig. The utilitarians hope by this golden bridge to get over the chasm which separates them from the promised land of the ideal. So the utilitarians there is John Stuart Mill. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. And why did he say that? Because people were accusing the utilitarians of just being pigs. Basically, you're like the Epicureans. And you know, if you know anything about the Epicureans, you know they didn't live like pigs, right? So the Epicureans are actually quite prudish and, and you might even say kind of boring hedonists and many utilitarians are as well. And then he said, but psychology stepped in and rudely interrupted. There are no, there are no unhappy people. The unhappy ones are all pigs. If people are unhappy, it's because they're desiring things that they shouldn't desire, right? And then he says, Dostoevsky's philosopher of the underworld, uh, Rashkalanikov, also Hamlet and such like, are not simply unhappy men whose fate might be esteemed or even preferred. They're simply unhappy swine, right? And so is this right? Is, is, is Shesta saying that Dostoevsky is throwing in our face these unhappy people who really are just pigs? Um, I, I think he's using this to actually challenge utilitarianism and, but also at the same time to say, you know, a lot of these characters are kind of dirtbags. Um, even Ivan Karamazov, you know, he's, he's got some good points to him, but there's also some bad sides. Of, actually, all the Karamazovs, right? Uh, dealing with struggle. Dostoevsky is kind of a battleground between Europe and Russia, which was an issue that was plaguing Russian thought. What should we accept from those Europeans? And he goes on and he's got a few interesting things to say about uh, how Dostoevsky, um, you know, compared to Tolstoy, was even more driven by his passions. Dostoevsky's dislike of Turgenev was stronger than Tolstoy's. He wrote of him very spitefully and offensively, libeling him rather than drawing a caricature. Even a caricature would be offensive. He libels him. Evidently, Dostoevsky, like Tolstoy, detested the European in their confrere. And then he says, to Dostoevsky, it was enough that Turgenev wore European clothes and tried to appear like a Westerner. Dostoevsky did the opposite. He tried to get rid of every trace of Europeanism from himself, apparently without great success, since he failed to make clear to himself wherein lay the strength of Europe and where his sting. So... Dostoevsky is a conflicted person who is trying to work out, you know, this, this, this sort of age-old question, what should we accept from those who seem to be more culturally advanced than ourselves? And he, you know, if you look at his characters, they engage in this discussion or represent different perspectives on it as well. He's also got a really interesting discussion of what he calls Dostoevsky's muddled relation with morality. And this is in, in discussion of, <clears throat> of women and attitudes towards women. So we could c contrast um, this against, you know, uh, Gogol and uh, Pushkin and some of these others and Tolstoy as well. And then we get to, to Dostoevsky. And he says, uh, Dostoevsky had very muddled relations with morality. He was too racked by disease and circumstance to get much profit out of the rules of morality. The hygiene of the soul, like that of the body, is beneficial only to healthy people. To the sick, it is simply harmful. You might actually do better to ease up on the rules if you're a sick person psychologically or physically. 
He says, the more that Dostoevsky engaged himself with high morality, the more inextricably entangled he became. And so Shestov uses the example of relations with, with women at this point. He says, he wanted to respect the personality in a woman and only the personality. So he came to the point where he could not look on any woman, however ugly, with indifference. The elder Karamazov is an affair with stinking Lizzie. In what other imagination could such a union have been contemplated? Dostoevsky, of course, reprimands Karamazov, and thanks to the standards of modern criticism, such a reprimand is accounted a sufficient to exonerate our author. But there are other standards. So he, you know, he's saying that Dostoevsky, even when it comes to morality, the characters explore morality, but Dostoevsky himself is kind of a conflicted person. And that's part of why we have so much we can learn from him. Right? Um, finally, the, the last thing that he says that I think is particularly interesting about Dostoevsky, and this applies to him as an author through his characters, here Shestov is talking about something that we ought to do, and then he uses Dostoevsky as an example. He says, the best way of getting, getting rid of tedious, played-out truths is to stop paying them the tribute of respect and treat them with a touch of easy familiarity and derision. Joke about them. Lower them. These, these, these truths that everyone is supposed to believe in. So he says, Dostoevsky did this by putting them into brackets, words like good, self-sacrifice, progress, and so on. While you still contest a certain truth, he goes on, you still believe in it, putting it into brackets allows you, putting these words into brackets, allows you to not take them as seriously. And what does he mean by brackets there? Well, these are actually quotation marks, what, what we call in English, in American English, quotes, right? And there's another meaning of bracketing, though, that I think is also kind of, kind of useful here that we can read in if we want to. When we talk about bracketing a claim or a belief or something, we're, we're suspending it. We're not saying whether it's, it's correct or not. We're suspending our judgment about it. And we're kind of doing something like that when we put something in air quotes, right? We say, such a good person. That's not the same thing as saying such a good person, is it? When we do the air quotes with it. So that's something that, that you do see Dostoevsky's characters doing in different ways, right? They, they sometimes will do that precisely in the orthographic sense, but they'll also frame things in their dialogue in such a way. They'll say, I wanted to be a good person, but then what is goodness really? Am I being a good person in this, this respect? I suppose you could say that I am, even though I've also got this other motive going on. That is another form of bracketing. That's another form of calling into question. And so that's, that's an important part of, uh, I would say, Dostoevsky's work in arranging what his characters are going to think, say, do, right? So these are some of the key points of uh, what Shestov thinks of and makes of Dostoevsky and Nietzsche in All Things Are Possible. He's, in many respects, following in their footsteps and at certain points going beyond what, what he thinks that they themselves have done as an existentialist author.